you know, I was watching uh, Turner Classic Movies recently, and they said that Alfred Hitchcock said the most important part of a good movie is the villain. Mm -hmm. So we have an amazing villain. The press has an amazing villain in Trump that sells newspapers and brings loads of money into uh, TV news, and he has a good villain in us. You know, the question is, is it going to go over the line? This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. We are proudly underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications. All right, welcome back. Thanks for tuning in today. Happy Election Day Tuesday. And uh, hopefully you've already voted or are in the process of voting. Well, actually, probably shouldn't be listening to the pod as you vote. So press pause, do your vote, and get back to it. Or you're about to vote later on today. Either way, just get it done. Get out there and vote. Okay, so today we have a pretty appropriate guest for Election Day. That's Maureen Dowd of the New York Times. I'll get to Maureen in a second. But before that, I want to talk about some exciting things happening at the podcast. We just launched a new website, a new anglepodcast.com. Please check it out. Our former producer, Stefan Borsum, did amazing work on that website. We're, we're really proud of it, and I encourage you to check it out. Check out our Twitter handle, A New Angle Pod, or our Instagram feed, A New Angle Podcast. Just trying to find more channels to reach all of you and get you into the conversation. And we do that. We build community. We try to build engagement so that we can improve the product for you. We want this to be a conversation with all of you. So please reach out and uh, give us a follow and tell your friends about it. Help us spread the word. All right, moving on to today's guest, Maureen Dowd of the New York Times. Just a legendary part of the the fabric of American politics for the last 30 or so years. I mean, Maureen joined the New York Times in 1983 as a reporter. Uh, she broke the Joe Biden plagiarism case back in 1987. We actually talk about that today because that was an important sort of initial touch point of mine into her work. In 1995, she moved to the over to the op-ed page and has just been doing a weekly column since that serves a critical watchdog function in Washington politics. Maureen has an incredible sensibility as a writer. Uh, her writing is beautiful, and she is able to call out bad behavior in such clear and visceral language when she sees it. Really appreciate the time we had with Maureen. She was on campus to do an event with her colleague, Carl Hulse, also of the New York Times, Washington correspondent. They discussed journalism in the age of Trump, and uh, today we do a little bit of that as well. Maureen also pushes me on my Shakespeare knowledge. I go deep on my memories of high school and uh, college English class. And it was just a super fun conversation. We, we thank Maureen for her generosity of time and thought and spirit. And uh, excited to bring you com that conversation right now with Maureen Dowd. So we're here today with Maureen Dowd. Maureen, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. So you said you've been in Montana once before uh, to visit Tom Brokaw and get some fly fishing. Is that yes, right? Yes, many years ago, uh, he invited me to his house in Montana, and he gave me a fly fishing lesson. And it was, um, he taught me like it was about the hands of a clock, like at 2 o'clock, you put the thing back. Everyone's going to kill me because oh, I'm yeah, giving ten to two. it wrong. 10 to 2, yeah. right. Um, and then I read somewhere that fly fishing actually um, uses up calories. So I was very excited that oh. I might learn to fly fish and lose weight. And burn some calories. Yes. Yeah. I had never thought of that application of fly fishing, but if that's an ancillary benefit, I think it's probably pretty good. Yeah. A river runs through it. You got to walk to a <laughs> bunch of places. And I always find that... Uh, I do more walking than I do actually casting. Yeah, I think there. it was like the the rushing water or kind of, you know, your stance against the rushing water was maybe what was burning the calories. But Indeed. Maybe it's an urban, suburban, exurban myth. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, one way or the other. Yeah. Um, so you're here with your colleague, Carl Hulse, right. to do an event with the journalism school this evening. Uh, journalism in the Age of Trump, I think, is the title. Right. Excited about that. Um, and we're just excited to get some, some time with you. I have to say that you've always been a journalist, columnist, that, that I've been just really intrigued by the way you kind of just get right to the human condition of a situation. Um, and I wondered if, if attributes of your, your upbringing, 
uh, you know, I noticed when I was sort of preparing for this discussion that your father was a police officer and you majored in Shakespeare and so some of these things, just wondering how that sort of shaped your approach to reporting. Actually, it's those two things exactly, because my father, when he retired from the police force, became a administrative assistant to a congressman and a senator. So when uh, he was 61 when I was born, so when I was growing up, he uh, worked on the Hill, and before that, as a police detective, he had been in charge of Senate security for 20 years. You know, he was at the McCarthy hearings, and he wrestled one of the Puerto Rican terrorists to the ground, and so he always judged politicians on whether they were phonies or decent people. Mm -hmm. He didn't he was a Democrat. He was stayed up all night the night Truman was elected because he was so excited, and he loved Harry Truman because Harry Truman was a really nice guy to the little people. But basically, he would judge people on you know their humanity rather than strict partisan lines, and I think I inherited some of that. And also in school, I studied Shakespeare and. It's just amazing that in many centuries, things don't change. It's all the same, you know, human emotions, like the Crayola crayon box of primary colors. We're, we deal with, LBJ said that the two things that make politicians most stupid are sex and envy. Mm. You know, and these are what Shakespeare dealt with, and this is what we're dealing with now, today. And I, I think Shakespeare is a really good kind of primer for covering politics, because politics, this is why I was very skeptical before the 2016 election about big data. You know, everyone kept mm -hmm. saying Trump can't win, Hillary is going to win, and, and Nate Silver would kind of make fun of us as columnists, because we were, he thought we were too focused on human aspects. Right, right. Punditry. But voting for president is the most personal vote you can make. And Anyone who thinks, you know, Hillary thought in her last campaign that she had a brilliant um, guy, uh, one of these demographic big data guys, and he was so brilliant that he was compared to the mathematician Russell Crowe played in A Beautiful Mind. Okay. And on election night, he came to her suite and he said, oh, well you know, I'm sorry, our model in Florida was wrong. and uh, On election night. Yeah, and <laughs> they were kind of like, what? And then, and then they're like, okay, well, we've still got Pennsylvania. And he goes, well, actually, if the model is wrong in Florida, it's wrong everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And I had always thought the over-reliance on big data was stupid just because politics is so personal. Mm -hmm. It's just such... For president, it's just a really personal thing about who you like and who you're going to trust with your future, your children's future, life and death matters. And it seems like we, I've heard you mention this before, like we, we have these patterns of oscillation between, you know, somebody who's folksly and likable and, you know, the, the president you want to have a beer with, and then you go, you know, like George W. Bush, and then you go to Obama, which is sort of the professor and is this, do you see this cycle of, of kind of our preferences as a populist? Well, you know, they used to make fun of this when this first came up years ago that, um, you know, they would say, well, who, who do you want to choose your pizza toppings? You know, but, but fundamentally, I think the Democrats have hurt themselves a lot over the years because they ignore this, that you have to have someone running for president who is alluring, who can relate to people, who can get them excited, who is excited themselves to be running. And if you ignore that and you kind of run someone who uh, cerebrally you think is the right person and people should make the choice cerebrally and this is the most accomplished person without choosing someone who is able to excite people and make them believe in them, you know, the Democrats just have had a tendency over the years to choose hall monitor types. Mm -hmm. And I think that hurts them because that is not the kind of person you want to vote for. You want to vote for the one who makes you excited and makes you believe in them. And it makes me think about, you know, you hear a lot about how politics is all tribal. 
these days. And it seems like the Republicans do a good job of creating tribe and then using tribe to push policy. It seems like on the left, maybe they use policy to try to create a tribe. And it's, it's certainly a less effective vehicle for creating a tribe. Yeah, that's interesting. Over the years, I think that Republicans have had more of a reputation of um, they will do anything to win. Yeah. Yeah, we certainly and, saw this last week. Yes, and Democrats have had more of a reputation of they, you know, try to be fair, but oftentimes they're sort of ineffectual. And I think that right now Democrats are in an identity crisis because they don't know whether to go with, like, the Michael Avenatti approach of, you know, uh, you've got to fight fire with fire and fight dirty and um, win or to try and keep their identity intact. And Eric Holder, you know, just gave a speech where he was saying when Republicans go low, Democrats should kick them Hmm. instead of the Michelle Obama thing of when they go low, we go high. So I think they're trying to figure out. But in essence, they have been kind of Democrats, the submissives to Republicans dominance, you know, if you want to use bondage language. Um, yeah, they've sort of let Republicans uh, kick them around a lot over the years, I think. Yes. I mean, I think that's why someone like Alexandria Oksana Cortez, mm-hmm. even though all her numbers don't add up, she brings fire and fight and excitement and charisma. You know, so that's what's been missing in the Democratic Party. Yeah. And, you know, along those lines, we can't help but try to get your thoughts on, you know, the events of last week and Kavanaugh. I mean, you've been such a prominent female reporter in politics for so long, um, you know, through the Anita Hill stuff, through the Clintons. I mean, that that was, you know, your Pulitzer Prize and all, all of that uh, great reporting and thought. Um, has anything changed in Washington with regard to gender and politics? Well, it was so horrible to watch the hearings and have to go through that again yeah. with actually three of the same <laughs> white male senators, two Republicans who were on the committee that kind of, uh, what's the right word, besmirched, uh, destroyed, shredded Anita Hill. They were more careful this time, but you know they were doing all the same discrediting behind the scenes. Um, yeah, and you had a great phrase in one of your columns about outsourcing the wet yeah. work or something no, like that. No, they outsourced the estrogen to right. uh, okay. the lawyer that Mitch McConnell referred to as the female assistant. Mm-hmm. You know, they, It was so pathetic that uh, the Republican side of the Judiciary Committee is still all white male. So in order to hide behind the skirts of a woman, they got this lawyer, but then they got impatient with her and didn't let her talk right, right. because they didn't think she was making the case very they well. They sort of proved their point in yes, the moment. Yes, exactly. Oh. So what do you make of that? I mean, they, they sort of have this, this uh, you know, the impulse to put this, this female uh, prosecutor up mm-hmm. there, sort of it uh, it signals an awareness of some context, but still the underlying attitudes don't I mean, appear to have changed. It made me long to see Mariska Hardigay from Law and Order come mm-hmm. in and, you know, uh, pound some heads. I mean, it just, you can't, it isn't a trial, and she's a trial lawyer, so she was slowly building up to points and trying to lay the groundwork for points, and the format just wasn't set up for that. Yeah, so, those five-minute increments yeah, and all that it, odd it things. it didn't work at all. You know, a friend of mine was saying she looked so uncomfortable. She looked like she just wanted to get back to the Marriott and have a good steak and whiskey sour, you know? <laughs> yeah. And thinking about all of that, I mean, it makes me think about, you know, your writing seems to, you just call out bad behavior and hypocrisy on all sides. I mean, it seems to be, I've heard your, your you describe your, your approach is a sensibility rather than an ideology. Is that is that accurate? Well, in the beginning, I don't. I was the first columnist, I think, who was trying to write a column. I was a political reporter for twenty years, so I wasn't doing it from the left or the right. I was trying to do it more from, you know, as you say, the vantage point of sensibility or morality or behavior. Not, uh, I'm going to defend a Democrat to the death or a Republican. And I think in the first few years, it 
it, people, it's hard for people to get used to. And it's funny, I come from a conservative family. So when a Democratic president is in and I'm critiquing them, my family loves me. But when a Republican sure. president is in, they get really mad at me. Like my older brother, Michael, got mad at me one Thanksgiving because I was criticizing W about the Iraq war. And I came home and he said, you know, if there was a hurricane, you would blame it on W. And then Katrina hit, and I blamed him on sure. W. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard because you don't have one home on the left or the right to go to, a community that loves you all the time. And Times readers, I think, have a hard time with it, and they get angry at me, you know, a lot. But I, I don't know how to do it any other way. If I could do it the other way, I would because it would be a lot easier. Yeah, but I don't think anybody of us, any of us would be better off for you doing it that way. I mean, you have this ability to, you know, call balls and strikes in a way that is, is kind of disappearing in the media. I mean, if, if you listen to Fox News, you never hear the other, you know, any of the balls and strikes. If you listen to MSNBC, you never hear the balls and strikes. And it's interesting. Like, I wonder how, how readers on either side re respond to your work or if they even find it. Well, you know, we are obsessed now with fake news. And, you know, it's a very, very important time for journalism. But we've dealt with fake news before. Mm -hmm. You know, there was fake news in Vietnam. The lead up to the Iraq war was fake news. You know, Trump picked up the term actually from it was used in the Russian bot kind of scandal and he got the term but when he says fake news he means news that he doesn't like or makes him look bad yeah so he's using it you know and as everything it's just being filtered through his id well and that brings us to something we talked about before we started recording and, and you know, his sort of personal brand and he, you know he certainly has a brand and one of the things about his brand that he he does is he's, he's able to kind of brand others you know with these clever nicknames oh and, that's so and, interesting you're using it in a double way yeah. i hadn't thought of that that's really interesting and I, I certainly don't want to draw similarities between you and president trump but you you do some clever work with nicknames in your writing as well i i try not to be so belittling. It's yeah, yours are not destructive. You know, there's a, a great line, and there's a new documentary about um, Mr. Rogers, and um, he he says that the thing he hates most is when people make other people feel less. Mm. And in a way, that's what Trump specializes in. And it was devastatingly effective during the 2016 Republican primary. But... Um, I love the idea that he's branding. And, you know, I talked to Steve Bannon about this, and he said that Trump, this this seems odd, but he claims it's true, uh, uses Young to come mm. up with his uh, branding really? people. That he wants to go deep psychologically. He tries to think of the exact psychological thing that would be most devastating. Most devastating. Yeah. Yeah, so like low energy to... And it was. I mean, Bush. it's even if you don't like Trump, sometimes once you've heard some of these things... Um, I mean, Crooked Hillary is genius. Well, he, well, so that was Steve Bannon's argument, that Trump has a genius about this and that he actually looked at Jung to come up with the ways that could be most psychologically penetrating... Um, and I know he, he thinks a lot about it because I was interviewing him during the campaign when he was formulating Crooked Hillary, and he would keep saying to me, I think I've got one for her, but I've really got to decide if it's just the right one. I mean, that's more right, important. Right. Other people are worried about their policy papers. He was worried about the branding. But to your point of you know voting for president being an emotional decision, I mean, the ideology maybe doesn't matter as much as the emotion. Yeah, and, you know, we were talking about this before, but I think in Shakespeare, Coriolanus is about how uh, uh, the public often gets so disgusted with politics that it longs for an outsider. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it was a general. But then the problem was that the general was too narcissistic and used to running things his way or the highway. So it didn't really work out because he wasn't a real politician. And we've seen that again and again, like the public has this longing for a businessman or someone outside, like with Ross Perot. And 
um, Trump and because they get so disgusted with politics. But then oftentimes those people get in and they don't really know anything about politics. Right, which cuts both ways. Yeah. Makes me wonder about, when we're talking about brands um, and, and individuals, expectations, right? So, you know, Trump is engaged in all these outrageous behaviors that people argue would be disqualifying of any other presidential candidate ever, right? Yet we don't have this expectation of, of particularly good behavior from him. Yet from somebody like President, former President Obama, there was this expectation of being perfect. That is a brilliant point. Okay, so here's something that's interesting, how much we've changed on this issue. When President Obama first got in, his social secretary, Desiree Rogers, gave an interview to the Wall Street Journal and said she was in charge of protecting the brand. Hmm. And David Axelrod got so angry that she used the word brand right. about Obama that her days were numbered. I mean, that one word sure, that kind of short-circuited her. her career at the White she House. She sort of pulled the curtain back too and much. now it's like all about the brand, <laughs> yeah. you know? I mean, that's all Trump is, his brand, Ivanka's brand. And, uh, you know, everything is the brand. I can't, I mean, it's very hard to tell if their brand is up or down. In a way, Ivanka's brand in New York is ruined, but she's doing better in China. Sure. You know, so, the, but the whole brand issue is fascinating. And I wonder what the expectations, I mean, that's why probably when you question um, the president's business acumen, when you question his commitment to winning or things like that, that's where it gets particularly sticky for him. A New Angle is underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications, two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. This is University of Montana President Seth Bodner, and you're listening to A New Angle. Yeah, he, um, you know, I, sometimes I call him, he's like the Rosemary's baby of politics, social media, and reality TV. Hmm. And it's funny that he's like our oldest president now, right? And he... Uh, well, I guess with, along with Reagan, but he um, he was helped in his campaign by Twitter, and he is making policy on Twitter. And it's just weird that the first president to sort of rule by Twitter is the oldest one. Um, you know, there he has a lot of paradoxes, obviously. Indeed, and you mentioned I Ivanka a while back. I mean, it seemed like at the onset of this presidency that, that people on the left sort of held her up and held Jared up as the, these are the sort of informed, enlightened uh, things to hope for. You know, they will take on liberal causes or stand up for what's right or whatever, and yet they've sort of maybe had mixed, uh, mixed results on those fronts. Well, I think that Ivanka was trying to, uh, you know, kind of be... Uh, contrarian to her father and also complicit with her father and the combination didn't really work in the end because people realized that uh you know she really didn't have that much power over him and I talked to her about it once and she said she just couldn't be in the Oval Office every minute like urging him to do something he didn't want to do and also I think she resented liberals as she put it acting like she was bernie sanders sure. i mean you know yeah, yeah. her politics were not again expectations right? but i think that's kind of been destroyed the idea that you know she's the protector of mother and children was destroyed when the administration separated you know babies babies were brought back after a month to their mothers covered in lice you know i mean if she can't do anything about that where is her power yeah, it seems like, you know, that story has sort of fallen out of favor with the media and for, for reasonable reasons. You well, know. you know, I was thinking about the brand thing um, as we're talking, and it's, you know, it, Trump used to be a sort of more benign, almost like buffoonish how, how many things he'd put his name on. If you would go to a Trump hotel in New York, it was on the water, it mm -hmm. was on, you know, he would just put his name and picture and everything. He was selling steaks and vodka and wine and now he's kind of selling you know derision and division those are the brands he sells yeah and you've got to wonder where that 
comes from? Is, I mean, it, is it comes from like the feedback he's getting in rallies yes. and like yes. this, this social I, feedback? Well, before he denounced me on Twitter, uh, I, I interviewed him a lot, um, occasionally over the years, decades, and then a lot during the election year. And he, I asked him that once. I said, after their had been violence at a Chicago rally and, uh, you know, reporters yeah. were having to get, Katie Turr had to get an armed guard and, you know, we're putting bulletproof doors in our office. And I, I said to him, why are you doing this? You, you were, you were a much less dark, threatening figure mm -hmm. when you were a persona in New York. Uh, why have you gone to the dark side? It's like you've taken this boat down <laughs> into dark, dark waters. And he really tried to answer me. He thought about it, and he said, well, I guess it's because I got to be number one doing that, mm. and I want to stay number one, so I have to keep doing that. So that's and where I, the votes are? Yeah, and the love. You know, yeah. he's an attention yeah. addict. Those are the people who are giving him the love. And I said, but violence at your rallies, how can you let that go on? And he said, oh, I think it adds a layer of excitement. Wow. Yeah. And it, well, I mean, certainly the way it's portrayed on television, it certainly adds a layer, layer of excitement. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking about brands, and I think he has reshaped the New York Times brand mm -hmm. because uh, the New York Times is and, and journalism in general is now seen as this uh, heroic, essential, you know, part of uh, our civic life that is helping to hold norms together. And so... Uh, you know, I was watching uh, Turner Classic Movies recently, and they said that Alfred Hitchcock said the most important part of a good movie is the villain. Mm -hmm. So we have an amazing villain. The press has an amazing villain in Trump that sells newspapers and brings loads of money into uh, TV news. And he has a good villain in us. You know, the question is, is it going to go over the line because we've just had this Washington Post reporter murdered by the Saudis. Right. And, uh, you know, is that because the Saudis know that Trump won't say anything? So it can get ugly really quickly, although there's a mutually beneficial aspect of it, that journalism is now safe for a little while. Uh, you know, there's a really, really dark, scary aspect of it too. And my office is right at the door where they're putting in these bulletproof doors. And you're thinking, you know, why? Yeah. This, this sort of cartoonish party guy from New York, how did this happen? Right. I mean, how does that feel at your place of work to feel like there's that, there's that reality? Well, it's very mixed. On the one hand, we're heralded as heroes yeah. in a way we weren't before. And on the other hand, we're behind bulletproof doors. I don't think Trump even realizes what he's doing. Our, he called our publisher in because his father loved the Times and he loves the Times. And he wanted to talk to A.G. Salzberger and A.G. Salzberger wasn't quite sure. This is about a month ago. And he went to the White House and Trump just wanted to woo him. Yeah. But... A.G. took the opportunity to tell him that he wanted him to stop using the phrase enemy of the people because it was really dangerous. And, you know, authoritarian regimes are putting mm -hmm. in laws about fake news that they can punish people with. And so um, I think Trump, you know, maybe would have been willing to do it, but somehow the whole thing, as usual with Trump, got bollocked up and... You know, I think A.G.'s point was that's a Stalinist phrase. And, you know, it's just at some point, uh, lots of people like McCain and Bush Sr. used to use the press as a foil. But at some point, Trump may be going over a line that will give people permission to do really ugly things. Yeah. And the relationship with The New York Times and your colleagues is particularly interesting. I mean, I've, I've Let's just listen to some interviews and, and read a bunch of Maggie Haberman's work. And it seems like it just seems like classic bully behavior for as much as he rails against the, you know, the New York Times and calls it fake news and bashes you guys all over the place. It seems like the outlet 
um, from whom he wants the adulation the most. Absolutely. And, you know, um, one time at the premiere of Oliver Stone's Nixon, I was talking to Bob Woodward, and he said, every president gets the psychoanalyst he deserves. (laughs) In other words, he was Nixon's. He was telling me I was Clinton's, and Maggie Haberman is Trump's. And funnily enough, Maggie's mother was a PR woman who worked not for Trump, but for a company she didn't do direct work, but for a company that did Trump's PR. And um, Maggie and Trump are definitely in each other's heads. She is a brilliant reporter. And out of all the people that deal with him, I think he, and she's very fair, but I think he wants her respect. She's almost the perfect reporter for the time, having come up through, you know, more of a tabloidy oh, kind you, of upbringing. Yes, exactly. It just seems like that approach to reporting on this particular character is, is very apt. Well, I think that, you know, I often say that Trump's most intense, passionate, you know, tumultuous relationship is not with Melania, it's with us. You know, like he's the selfie president and we're the selfie stick. He's Narcissus, we're the mirror. Mm -hmm. You know, he used to pretend to be his own PR guy to call the tabloids in New York and claim that Madonna wanted to sleep with Donald Trump and Carla Bruni wanted to sleep with Donald Trump. And he wouldn't even change his voice. When that came out during the campaign, I thought that was the end of his campaign. That just shows how naive I was. Gosh, that's sort of <laughs> like a, uh, yeah. Like with a fake it's name. It's almost endearing at this yeah, point as yeah, far as the quaint. suite of things to choose from. Right, quaint, it's so exactly. quaint, yeah. Gosh, so I want to uh, transition a little bit, and, and I feel like I have a responsibility as an educator to talk about like what lies ahead. You know, if, if you were trying to... Um, speak to young journalism students about how to get into the field and how to find your voice in the field and how to approach the work that needs to be done in the next 10, 20, 30 years. It's so hard. Well, I did just speak to a journalist class here. And, you know, it's, it's hard because on the one hand, journalism is now more heralded and essential than ever because of all the Trump has created an alternative universe and Mm -hmm. you need journalists to kind of pierce that. But on the other hand, you know, all the community newspapers are dying and, you know, there are fewer ways to kind of come up through farm teams than there used to be. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly how to advise kids except that I think at least with Trump, they can see why journalism is so important. I mean, I used to get very nervous with Dick Cheney because it made me more nervous to see someone who was staying within the norms that all the journalists trusted and the bad stuff he was doing. It took years to come out. At least with Trump, you can mobilize in real time. Sure. You know, if he does something awful, you can react in real time. Mm -hmm. Cheney, you know, would take years for people to realize, oh, my gosh, maybe he's off his rocker. So, um, but I think they can see how... We are such, it always sounds corny when I talk about checks and balances, Uh but I think that's what we do. We are part of the checks and balances, and it's like the most important work you can do. And what gives you hope in that work? Like, what what brings you joy in your work? I mean, you cover a lot of, uh, unfortunately, hypocrisy, bad behavior. You call out a lot of things that need to be called out, but is there, is there... What are the aspects of your work that bring you joy? Well, it's hard because, you know, I love to use humor. And I think one of my idols is Jonathan Swift. And I think that in the worst of circumstances, you can always use humor as a vehicle to get across serious points. But now because of uh, Trump's, you know, fake news, uh, our editors are kind of nervous about using satire because they think... You know, it can be confused that readers will, you know, get confused and take it seriously. And a lot of readers don't are so frightened and, uh, you know, angry about Trump that they don't want to hear, you know, the lighter side of anything, which I understand that. But that's hard for me because, 
you know, I love using that as a vehicle to get truths across. But I guess until we get past this, like, really dark time, it's not going to be as accepted. I mean, Saturday Night Live, you know, can still do a good job sometimes, like the Matt Damon skit sure. was yeah. brilliant. But, um, Although you know, I wonder if I wonder if they are... Yeah, they're sort of becoming a little like Michael Moore in a way. Yeah, I like just, nobody goes to Michael Moore film to get their mind changed. Right. I just saw his movie uh, recently. Yeah, and uh, you're right. I mean, that's the problem. Everything is prejudged, so you know everybody already has their mind made up. So it's hard. Yeah, it's kind of like. You know, you would, you could argue that in a world with so much more access, so much more uh, information, so many more information sources, so you know, so much sort of flatness in the ability to communicate, that people will be more informed. Yet, it's causing this polarization of information sources, and it's almost making the problem worse. I know it's, you know, it's, it's hard because journalists are schizophrenic. They are half looking at a situation as a journalist, and unfortunately, we're in a profession where often somebody else's worst day is our best day. Mm, Yeah. So, you know, Trump is a great story, but then you're also looking at it as a citizen, and you're seeing the country be torn apart. And so the citizen part of you is upset at at the divisions that seem that seem like they can never be bridged or healed. And then part of you is this is the most amazing story I'll ever cover. Right, so, right. you know. Yeah, I think of that. I, 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 one of my first entry points into your work was, um, you know, and I just sort of remembered this when I started kind of preparing for our discussion was you broke the story of, of Joe Biden. Oh, gr- yeah. Grabbing texts from RFK. And I don't know where I picked up on it, but there was a moment where you saw him after that story had come out and, and I'm sure you've seen him many, many, many times since that story came out. But you know, there is this, yeah, your best day is somebody's awful Well, day. that that's an amazing example. I didn't even know if I ever wrote this. But, yeah, uh, when I was going um, to the press conference where he announced he was dropping out of the race, uh, I took a back stairway up on Capitol Hill to the conference room, and I saw I ran into him, and he was by himself waiting to go on and we just kind of locked eyes and it was very painful. My dad, as a policeman, had to shoot someone in self-defense once and and he said it felt like there were bones in his throats. And, you know, even if you're in the right and what you're writing, you you know, it's hard. You're affecting people's lives. And um, the weird thing about Biden is that then we got to be, you know, uh, on a much more cordial basis over the decades. I don't know why. You know, he he thanked me because he got an aneurysm then, and right. he said if he had been on the campaign trail, he would have died. And also, he told me once, he told uh, President Obama, like, cut me out of his uh, columnist briefings because he didn't like my what I was writing. And uh, Biden said he told him, you know, don't cut her out. <laughs> It's better to work with her yeah, than yeah, against yeah. her. I would and, agree. Yeah, and he called me a couple times recently to talk about politics, and it, it's just weird how that whole thing kind of turned around over the years. But I think if you try and be fair with people, that they will realize it and in the end respect you. Yeah, and I've heard you make the point about um, you know, one of the mistakes that, that Biden made was not having the right people around him. And that seems to be an important lesson for a lot of our public figures. Well, we, that's, yeah, that's another Shakespearean thing, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, Othello and Iago. I mean, it, I have seen so many leaders, and not only in politics, self-destruct, because the higher they get, the more they surround themselves with sycophants. Mm-hmm. And you can either hear the bad news from someone who cares about you, who's close to you, or you can wait and hear it on the outside. Right. And hear all the compliments from the sycophants. And I'm shocked at the number of peop- times that leaders choose the sycophants, mm-hmm. you know, rather than the honest people. 
How do you, I mean, that makes me think about that. The, and in, that's what happened in Lear. Like Cordelia told her father the truth and the other two daughters didn't. And now, you're, he, now you're testing my Shakespeare. He cast, he <laughs> cast her out because she was honest with him. And that's what a lot of, of leaders do. Makes me think about that infamous sort of anonymous op-ed that the Times published a few mm. a month ago or you so. You know, it's a Halloween costume now. The anonymous. A, a sexy Halloween costume. Oh, of course. Gosh. Available on Amazon. Yeah. So it was The Handmaid's Tale. Oh, gosh. I mean, it makes me think about that. I mean, are there, I mean, you probably have sources on the inside who talk to you about the, the real state of affairs in the White House and, and you know, is this mythology that people on the left create about, you know, a constellation of people trying to protect the country from the president? Is there any truth to that, or is this just all mythology? Um, I think some some people uh, think they're doing that. For instance, I think Jim Mattis does. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. You know, when Nixon was getting drunk and talking to the portraits, Henry Kissinger set up a pact with the generals, and he was right. and Nixon was actually drunkenly talking about dropping a bomb or something. And Henry Kissinger set up a pact and said, "If he calls you and talks about dropping a bomb, just call yeah, yeah. me." That's the trigger. And I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if Mattis and Kelly had some kind of thing like that. And thank God Trump has no substance issues because can you imagine? Right. right. But. And I don't even think Trump is that. He's belligerent in every way except actual war. I think mm. he, you know, with exercise, he thinks exercise is a waste of time. You could be doing business. And sure. I think he sort of thinks the same about war. It's destructive yeah, unnecessarily. Yeah, because he keeps talking about Iraq and that was a waste of seven trillion dollars. And so, but I wouldn't be surprised if um, some of these guys in the same way Gary Cohn snatched uh, an agreement about South Korea off his desk if some of these guys have certain packs in place to make sure that Trump doesn't do anything crazy because he doesn't he doesn't really understand how the government works. Steve mm -hmm. Bannon told me that when he you know, when Trump wanted to fire Comey, Bannon tried to explain to him, like, you can fire Comey, but the investigation goes on. You right, can't right. fire it's the not FBI. Over. Yeah. And he didn't get it. You know, he really doesn't understand anything about government. He thinks he's still dealing with real estate lawyers in New York, that sure. you can bully them and shame them and fire them. And, you know, he doesn't really understand how it works. Well, you know, that, that, that narrative and that sort of brand appeals to a lot of his base. Yeah. I mean, some guy that's just going to come in and say, you're fired. And, you know, yeah, well, his base, on TV. his base includes my whole family, who I like to describe as my little basket of deplorables. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, well, that's, I mean, we're, we're sort of up against the end of our time, but I'd love to engage you about the Clintons and Hillary mm. in particular, but that's a whole nother... We could do a whole nother podcast about just that. Yeah, we could. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maureen, thanks for being so generous with your time and insights. And it's just a great honor to have you on campus. I know our students and our community are really excited about it. And uh, I look forward to the event this evening. And I look forward to uh, you know, reading more of your columns because you're a voice we need right now. Well, thank you. You're a great brand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with, with Maureen Dowd as much as I did. Uh, check out her weekly column at the New York Times. It's beautifully written, and the insights are powerful. Uh, she's an important voice in politics and has been for a long time, so I encourage you to, uh, to follow her work. Okay, next week, another incredible woman in journalism. We have Missoula's own Amy Martin. Amy Martin has a long history in Missoula as a journalist, as, uh, as an entertainer, as a writer, as a reporter, and uh, her latest project, The Threshold Podcast, is just crushing it. It's incredible work. Uh, they do in-depth environmental reporting one story at a time. Their first season was all about the, the, the bison herd that's starting to expand in population, the history of it in the uh, greater Yellowstone area. And this season, Threshold is focused on the Arctic and climate change in the Arctic. And I had a great conversation with Amy about her work and um, the story she's trying to tell through the Threshold podcast. Stay tuned for next week. Remember that a new angle was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. By now, you've been listening long enough to know that these guys are big and that they sell pretty much everything electrical you would ever need. 
but you might not know that they hire a ton of University of Montana students. If you want to learn more about careers at CED, visit cedcareers.com. It's a great website name. Before we go, I want to thank some important peeps. Kamzar, Elizabeth Willie, interns, Aspen Runkle, Mason Dow, and Max Gibson. Huge thanks to VTO for the tunes, and finally props to Jeff Meese, our master of all things sound. Before we go, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word, and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks a lot. See you next time.